It's just been so great to have Olivia here paddling with us and um, her dad as well. They were in a serious car accident a few months ago and so it's great just to have her back and healthy again and keeping up with us. So yeah, that's been cool. Pelvis and all. <laughs> it was actually a really scary story but also a really beautiful story of the Lord's faithfulness through really challenging times. I actually love to share it with you guys. I think it's a really cool story and it really shows the glory and the hope of the Lord. Oh, that was the day I got to eat dough again. Oh, I remember that day. Looking back, it's funny to me to think about how much I thought I was in control of my life. I had a new home in Pensacola and had been accepted to the nursing school I wished to attend. My life in my eyes seemed perfect. But what the Lord had in store for me was greater than I ever could have imagined. On August 11th, my dad and I were traveling down the interstate when we were hit by a semi-truck, traveling also at interstate speeds. After being hit, I remember nothing from our 45-minute extraction as I was unconscious. The EMS team and the police cut us out using the jaws of life and put my dad and I each in separate helicopters to arrive at the nearest trauma center. Upon arrival, my lips flew blue and my body was gray and I had the faintest pulse in one side of my neck that was also quickly lost as I began to flatline. My trauma surgeon quickly cut into my chest from my sternum to my armpit where she spread my ribs apart to clamp the aorta of my heart to prevent the blood from going into my abdomen where the worst of the hemorrhaging was taking place. This sent the remaining blood to my brain to avoid brain damage, where she then began to cauterize things in my abdomen. I had a brain bleed and slipped into a coma. At this point, it seemed that all hope was lost. I was given a 1-3% to chance of survival by the EMS team and paramedics. And when it seemed it could not get any worse or that there was no chance of survival, our God saved my life that day. I came into the trauma bay via helicopter and hemorrhagic shock, suffering from a ruptured bladder, a shattered pelvis which my surgeon noted was horribly deformed, a hemorrhage near the right kidney, kidney and liver lacerations, numerous rib and spine fractures, multiple pulmonary contusions, a pulmonary emboli, a right frontal brain bleed, a concussion, a sacral break, and over 50% of my blood volume bled out into my abdomen. I went through six surgeries in my first four days in the ICU. I had a plate and six screws put into my clavicle and many pelvic surgeries to align everything as best they could. I had a catheter placed in my stomach and the top of my bladder as they were unsure the extent of damage done to my bladder. I had two chest tubes put into the left side of my chest, a two huge permanent screws put into my sacrum, and a pelvic external fixator ring which would make me non-weight bearing for 14 weeks. I had to relearn what felt like everything, how to roll over, how to sit up, how to get out of bed into my wheelchair, and how to slide transfer to any surface. I had intense physical and occupational therapy, which really helped rebuild my strength and endurance. I quickly became friends with the therapists there and enjoyed talking with them and the other residents. Some of them nicknamed me Sunshine, as I was one of their youngest patients there and always up to chat. On occasion, there was some snarky banter between me and the therapist as they would ask me to do some physical task I thought impossible due to my poor physical state. I would look at them and ask, did you know I was the one that was hit by a semi? I was eventually cleared to go home from rehab and was able to go home to my own bed and sleep in my own room. I began doing home health, physical, and occupational therapy three times a week while I still had my X-Fix on. We named my X-Fix Gladys after Gladys Allward. Gladys Allward was a strong and faithful missionary in the Lord and we needed this X-Fix to be strong and faithful in my pelvis. On November 11th, Gladys was removed. This was one of the best days of my life. This procedure was done in an outpatient clinic without anesthesia. 
I went into the procedure and my surgeon explained to me everything that would happen. She asked if I had any questions and I asked, is it okay if I remove the X-Fix myself? She said she didn't see why not and showed me exactly how to do it. I removed the first few screws that were deep into my pelvis. This was an amazing experience and something else that I could do as a patient before I went to nursing school. In December, I had a surgery at UAB for a possible bladder reconstruction. It went so well and, had, and I had such an amazing team of surgeons there. And in January of 2021, I had my eighth procedure and through further testing, I was diagnosed with a neurogenic bladder. I was absolutely devastated and overwhelmed at first. I had prayed so hard that things would heal normally and that my surgeon could just fix the damage. I did not want to deal with the consequences of a neurogenic bladder for the rest of my life and frankly, I was not happy that this was a part of my story. This pity party for myself made things worse as I started thinking about all the things that I didn't want to be a part of my story. But isn't it funny how we think we should have a choice? When did I become sovereign over my own life and have the same knowledge as my Lord? Having to point my eyes back on the Lord over and over again and surrender areas of my life that I never thought I would have to was a good place for my heart to dwell. These circumstances were not easy by any means. The physical pain was absolutely excruciating and unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. The pain seemed to worsen at night when I just longed to be sleeping. I still experience daily pain and wonder if I'll ever live pain-free again. The mental pain also affected my daily life, wondering the what ifs. Will my life ever look the way I had hoped? Will I ever be able to physically carry a child? There were many nights where I cried out to the Lord asking why I was still here on this painful earth. It would have seemed so much easier to me to be in heaven with my Savior rejoicing in a perfect body than to continue to live on this painful earth. But the Lord has numbered our days, and I will not die a millisecond before he has ordained. And clearly, August 11th was not my day. With all that being said, while August 11th was one of the worst days of my life, it was also simultaneously one of the best. The Lord taught me things through suffering that I never would have known otherwise. I got a bigger glimpse at the power and the glory of our Lord and the hope that is within him. I placed our God in a box, living and planning my life as I chose. I had never prayed such big prayers in faith. The Lord completely overwhelmed my fear with peace while I learned that the Lord was surely my portion even when there wasn't enough. Today, I praise my God for the 28 scars that cover my body from my clavicle to my pelvis. For with each one of them is a great sign of grace and mercy. I am thankful that this happened to me personally, because had it happened to a friend or an acquaintance, it would be easy to forget the miracles of the Lord and go on with day-to-day -day life. But now I have physical scars and painful daily reminders that He is faithful in our lives. While it also pushes me to long for a day when we will be with our Savior rejoicing in a perfect world. Suffering shakes us to trust, a trust deeper than ourselves, and this is a good place for us to rest. Psalm 23 states, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is one of my favorites because it shows us that we should not just be wishing for the green pastures while in the hard times of suffering in our lives but that we can commune with the Lord in those times of trouble, following the shepherd, knowing that he is good and he has worked out everything for our good for those who love him. This good may not feel good at the moment, but the outcome will be good and more than we could have ever imagined. Even if we do not see the good from our circumstances during our own lifetime, we can trust knowing that his timing and his sovereign reign and his power is perfect and far greater than our finite human minds could ever conjure.
One of my favorite verses has also been 2 Corinthians 12, 9, which states, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Never has this verse seemed so real to me. His grace is sufficient for you when you are at death's door, and it is sufficient for you when you are in green pastures. It's sufficient when you're awake and when you're sleeping. It's sufficient for all these things. Therefore, I will boast and show of my weakness, especially my complete physical weakness, because the glory of the Lord can shine more brightly through such brokenness. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2 has also been such an encouraging verse through all of this. It says, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. I remember laying in my hospital bed and thinking, I can do this, for no matter how hard it may seem, the flame will not consume me. This was encouraging because it states when you pass through the waters and when you walk through the fire. There's no if you encounter suffering, but when. For the Lord did not even spare his own son, so why should I think he would spare me? It is also through such hard suffering that I had to completely rely on the Lord, even for my next breath. This was a beautiful thing and a wonderful place for my heart and mind to dwell. I hope you can join me in marveling and praising our God for what He has done. I hope there are also a few things that you can take away, points that are applicable to your own life, no matter what it looks like, no matter what your suffering entails. Whether hit by a semi, hearing a devastating diagnosis, losing a loved one, or just discouraged by the day-to-day -day life we live in this sinful and broken world, I hope you can see these things. That there is joy that can be found in suffering. Joy that is explainable only by a holy and faithful God. Joy that when we focus our fears on the Lord rather than ourselves can fill even the hardest days. I was reading through a journal entry I wrote while I was in the hospital and it says, It is easy to let fear creep in and govern our daily lives, but it is then that we lose sight of the Lord. We do not want fear to be in control. As we fix our eyes less and less upon Jesus and the more on our suffering and pain, we allow things other than the Lord to govern us and our thoughts. There is no hope in anything besides Christ. No matter how hard our circumstances, we need not let our focus be on the things of the world. Christ, His power, and His faithfulness shrink in size when we do not daily put our eyes on Him. If suffering has taught me anything, it is that we are not in control of anything. But Christ is the one who is in control of our lives, numbers our days, and fills our hearts with joy. I need to fix my eyes on Him rather than the things of this world that will never satisfy. When it seems there is nothing left to be thankful for, or when it seems that we are going to be overcome by our circumstances, we can still be thankful for a beating heart. After my ribs were spread apart to reach my heart, they never fully went back to how they were created. Now when I stand, I am able to see my heart beating between the gap in my ribs. I am thankful for this. While I was in the hospital, sometimes I would just look down and watch my heart beating, praising our God for my life and for a heart that continues to beat. Even when it seems our days cannot be any darker and there is no more hope, we can thank our Father for a heart that beats. For a beating heart in and of itself, though seemingly insignificant, is a symbol of great love, faithfulness, and mercy from our Father. Thanks for watching The Wild Way, and double thanks if you've already liked or subscribed to our YouTube channel. If you want to get more involved with us, visit our Patreon website. Hit the link below to learn how you can become a member of our Patreon team and partner with us. Also, you'll get awesome benefits, like exclusive vlog videos, like Wild Brothers merchandise, and a lot more.